he just seemed like a douchebag. Everybody get up. You can go and dissect a billion reasons in hindsight why Robin Thicke's career cratered so thoroughly and so quickly after reaching Smash Heights. You can point to things he said, things he did. You can look at the content of his work and the quality of it, changing trends, politics of the day, botched marketing. But if we're really looking at why Robin Thicke imploded so fast and so hard, you have to start with one simple truth. There was just a vibe coming off of him. A mildly but tangibly repellent vibe. Just something that made people unhappy when he was happy and happy when he wasn't. You're probably the most hated man in America right now. The same year that Robin Thicke crashed and burned, Ben Affleck turned in the performance of his career in Gone Girl in a role only Affleck could play, a philandering asshole struggling to make himself sympathetic to a world that seems like it was just waiting to turn on him. It may as well be the Robin Thicke story. And it feels like more than coincidence that Affleck handpicked a model from the Robin Thicke video to play his girlfriend. The two men are just kindred spirits with that same kind of curious anti-charisma. Too handsome and charming to relate to, but not really handsome or charming enough to admire. When Thicke lost the Blurred Lines plagiarism lawsuit, a questionable legal decision that fucks up copyright law to this day, I saw people blaming Thicke and not Pharrell or T.I. or any of the other writers, even after he admitted during the deposition that he didn't even write anything because he was so coked up and wasted during recording, a fact that only brought out people's schadenfreude all the more. Everyone just liked seeing him fail. And fail he did. All I do is keep it light, keep it light. In 2014, Robin Thicke released Paula, an album dedicated to and named for his estranged wife, Paula Patton. Now that was only five years ago, so I probably cannot call this record a career killer quite yet. Robin Thicke is still in the public eye. Far stranger comebacks have happened. I'm gonna call it a career killer anyway as have most people, because Paula bombed like nothing else has ever bombed in the history of bombs. We've seen big names fail to debut at number one and throw public fits about their low numbers, but if they had seen sales as low as Paula's, they'd melt like the Wicked Witch. If he ever has a hit again, it'll be a goddamn miracle, because Paula failed on every level possible. He was supposed to save his marriage and continue the upward momentum of his career, and all it did was firmly end both, while cementing everyone's impression of him as a weird, unlikable creep. I gotta get a go get a I wrote a whole album about what are you doing, man? For the love of God, no. This is train records. Everybody get up. August twenty fifth, twenty thirteen. The MTV Video Music Awards. My God, was it so long ago. Robin Thicke will never be bigger than he is that night. It's not exactly a moment anyone would pick as their career high point. Him wearing a ridiculous suit and being mostly a spectator to the Miley twerk catastrophe of 2013. But regardless, there he is in the most talked about music moment of the year, singing the song that made him a star. Touch me on the and here he is, less than a year later, with the opening track of his follow-up album, Paula. It's called You're My Fantasy. It's a sexy, bossa nova, acoustic guitar love jam of the kind he was known for in his pre-Blurred Lines days. It's awfully low-key and, let's be honest, not particularly memorable. Just another Robin Thicke song. You would not listen to it and think anything of it, except right towards the end. Come back to me. Something's wrong. In fact, things started going wrong right at the VMAs. In the days following it, pictures circulate from the after party with Robin Thicke's hand seen prominently grabbing some random girl's ass. Robin Thicke is a married man. His wife is at that party. Reports circulate about his behavior. Rumors are the marriage is falling apart. He swears things are okay, and he says that he and her are, quote, the most functional, dysfunctional marriage in Hollywood. Yeah, reassuring. 
These rumors are very bad for him, because as an R&B lifer who had mostly sung hot and heavy bedroom anthems throughout his career, his core fan base is mostly women. Some singers make being a callous heartbreaker part of their image, but that's not him. There's a great article by Cracks Adam Todd Brown, which I'm cribbing from a little in this video, where he describes Thicke's public image as a ladies' man for one lady only. That lady being model actress Paula Patton, his wife. They have a great story. They're childhood sweethearts. They met at a dance when he was 14. The first night they met, he serenaded her with a Stevie Wonder song. See, it's those romantic instincts that would launch him to stardom. You can't go wrong by singing Stevie. Except that one. Please tell me he didn't sing that. Please tell me that's not true. But regardless, Robin Thicke is very publicly in love with his beautiful hot wife. She is on his album covers, in his videos. As revealed later, she secretly co-writes songs with him, and their careers take off at about the same time. She starts getting serious parts the same year he has his first hit. She lands her first big lead role the same year he hits number one. His image is deeply intertwined with hers, so Robin Thicke failing at his marriage is like finding out Snoop Dogg has never done drugs, or that John Cena hates sick kids. On February 24th, 2014, despite his public statements, Robin Thicke and Paula Patton finally separate. Uh, any hope that they will handle this issue privately is gone when Robin Thicke starts dedicating songs to her in his concerts. I want to dedicate this, uh, this song to her. Weird. Back to the album. I never should have raised my voice or made you feel so small. The second song off of Paula is titled Get Her Back. It will be the first single off the record. All I want to do is keep it light, keep it light. Same gentle bossa nova guitar as the first song, but this one pleading and earnest and promising to make things right. I gotta get a go, get a go, get a go, get a back. I boggle that this is the single he chose to lead off with. Gotta cherish her for life. I gotta get a go, get a go. Get her back is a wisp of a fart of a nothing of a song. I suppose he had to make this the lead single because getting her back is the thesis of the record and a subtextual message he has to send to his audience at the same time. You know, please forgive me. You know, I worry that I'm making this album sound like a terrible idea from the get-go. Pot stars have a long tradition of mining uncomfortable public drama and turning it into gold records, right up to the present day. But there's one in particular that looms large over Paula. Watch this. These are my confessions. In early 2004, Chili from TLC reveals in a radio interview that her recent breakup with Usher is because he cheated on her. Usher takes the public drama and turns it into the album Confessions, which becomes one of the best-selling albums of the 21st century. Towards the end of that album is the track Can You Handle It from a young, unknown songwriter named Robin Thicke. Confessions is clearly what Robin's modeling the new record on. Here's the difference. Well, there's many differences, but here's a difference. Confessions launch with Yeah, an unstoppable, in-your-face club jam. It followed that with the first single directly confronting the breakup, Burn, which is a shirt-rending wail of grief. So many days, so many hours, I'm still burning to do it These are songs big enough to A, continue the momentum of a white-hot singer with superstar aspirations, and B, match the ambitions of a concept album about guilt and heartbreak. Get her back is neither of these things. It is too small to launch an album, plus it's skin-crawlingly smarmy and insincere. I spent decades absorbing shit-ass apology songs, so this isn't the worst I've heard, but it's up there. All I want to do is give you that thing, play you that song you and your girlfriend sing. I just want to sing a song for you. Oh, yeah, that'll make it better. All I want to do. All I want to do. Who gives a fuck what you want to do? The dark, desaturated video would have you believe that this is a song of great angst and pain, but it's not. It is absurd to think that this is a lead single. It's a horribly stupid decision by a man who will later admit he is high out of his mind making this album and has lost all good judgment. What can I say? Oh, what can I do? After this is the third song, Still Madly Crazy, another romantic profession of eternal love. It's a short little creepy video for this. But I can't control it, I'm still madly crazy for you. Yeah. The great soul singers make you feel like they're singing to you personally. And this song almost makes me wish he was so I could reject his shitty overtures right to his face. And then something happens in the album. 
he just gives up entirely trying to sound romantic and just starts writing about what a fucking loser he is. One, two, look at you. Three, four, she locked the door. I keep knocking and knocking and knocking and knocking. He's doing his best Joe Cocker, blue eyed soul man thing, and the backup singer's playing his wife really let him have it. I'm trying to tell you, you were pushing me too far. She locked the door. I'm trying to warn you, you were suddenly All right, you can't. I'll be honest, this is the first song that really works. And he follows that with a song about how he's just going to enjoy life as a single man, and she will too, and that's actually good. And you know what? Again, probably a better move than how this album started. Prostrating yourself pathetically to your ex, which is what he's doing in public. May 18th, 2014, the Billboard Music Awards. Robin Thicke wins an award for Blurred Lines, I'd like to thank uh, my wife for her love and support and uh, for putting up with me all these years. <clears throat> and the cringy drunk text of a single, Get Her Back, makes its debut later that night. All right, child, help me get her back now, yeah? He says, help me get her back several times. Go, put your hands together, y'all. Help me out. Let me, help me get her back now. So whatever he's attempting to do to Paula with this public message, if you cheer him on, you are complicit in it. Shout out to the uncomfortable looking woman in the front row. She speaks for us all. Meanwhile, back on the album, we get this line. I'm moving to New York. That's actually Paula herself who recorded that for the album. Probably the last gesture of goodwill Robin got from her, or anybody. I don't know what I expected to follow that announcement of separation. It wasn't this. This is living in New York City, which is a full-on James Brown pastiche. It doesn't really have anything to do with the breakup, and it kind of slaps. B U S Y. Why not? It's no Uptown Funk, which is only a few months away from dropping, but it's pretty solid. And at this point in the album, I had to wonder, is this album actually kind of good? Who is Robin Thicke anyway? Who was he before the backlash? Like, believe it or not, he wasn't always known as a douchebag. Rolling Stone called him gentlemanly. I went back and listened to the albums before Blurred Lines, and I hear a genuine talent a silky smooth vocalist, an extremely gifted songwriter, and, like Bruno Mars, clearly a connoisseur of the classics. He knows his shit, and he's good at it. And yet, and yet, there is just something that doesn't click about the guy, some missing weapon in his arsenal that keeps him from joining the A-list. I'm not usually this blunt, but I just straight hate looking at his face. I hate looking at his dumb, smug, stupid face. That cracked article I mentioned earlier called Robin Thicke, The New Vanilla Ice, and it lists a whole ton of connections between them. Public images that fell apart, one big hit that dwarfs all the others, getting sued for plagiarism, but there's one big connection that it doesn't mention, which is that they were both destroyed by the same song that made them huge. Blurred Lines was Robin Thicke's big pop move, his chance to jump from just R&B to the mainstream. But Ice Ice Baby and Blurred Lines are the worst kind of big hit. Too catchy to not listen to, but by the 10th or 20th time you hear it, the flaws in the artist are just too obvious to ignore. Vanilla's feeble rhymes, Robin's jack-off sense of humor, and just an obnoxious personality behind both. I think calling Blurred Lines a rape anthem is probably overdoing it. And in hindsight, I kind of regret wading into that discourse. But there's no denying, it's a skeevy, pushy song. And if it reminded people of every dipshit who wouldn't leave him alone at the bar, I don't blame them. Usher was able to play the remorseful heel because he had people's respect after years of hits. Robin is trying to propel the Paula album with goodwill from blurred lines that he just does not have. But somehow at the same time, I found myself having some kind of sympathy for the devil here. Yelling and screaming and smacking me, how could you do this, you spoiled little rich kid? In the middle of the record, you get Black Tar Cloud, which is the darkest song on the record. 
and it is detailed. You were lying in bed. Truth. Said you took 20 pills. Truth. Now I'm calling the ambulance police. I'm freaking out till you said chill. Jesus Christ. Okay, there is one other record besides Confessions that looms large over this one. That is Here My Dear by Marvin Gaye. Not the first time Thick drew inspiration from Marvin Gaye, ho ho. Yeah, like Robin, Marvin was coked out of his mind while making Here My Dear, which is an album about his then recent divorce. It's super acclaimed by critics. I actually find it kind of a difficult listen because Marvin's so bitter and angry. But there is definitely a cringy fascination in it. It's so TMI. You listen to it and you know everything. And you feel like you shouldn't be watching this, but you can't help yourself. Don't you say it, baby. That isn't quite the same as what Robin's doing, because Robin's not spiteful. He mostly lays into himself. But there is that same kind of voyeuristic, can't-look-away aspect to it. It's morbidly fascinating, and shows the weird contradiction in the album's own mission. He's trying to get Paula back, but the project fails the hardest when it's trying to be romantic. It's at its best when Robin's admitting what a giant shithead he is and airing all their dirty laundry. None of this could possibly make her want to take him back. And maybe the best song about the breakup is a song called The Opposite of Me. All that she wants is the honesty. All that she wants is the opposite of me. A gentle early 60s sounding thing where he seems to realize that none of this is going to work. All that she wants is the action, not the words. If you read the album as Robin going through the five stages of grief, this would be acceptance, and it plays a lot better than denial or bargaining. It sounds like him finally being honest with himself about how badly he fucked up. But again, that's not what he's doing in public. You and I are meant to be forever love. June 29th, 2014. Robin Thicke performs the album closer Forever Love at the BET Awards. He is doing his best to look the penitent, heartbroken man. He is not pulling it off. Oh, that pause. Oh, he's so moved. He had to interrupt his performance to hold back his tears. Oh, look at that. Oh, could that possibly be more contrived? Ugh. What Paula thinks about any of this, we don't know. We might never. Maybe it's not really meant for her. Maybe it's all a show for his career and she's aware of all that. Who knows? But all indications are that it was for real. And if so, it's fucking gross. It's manipulative, and it's creepy. It's like pressuring someone into marriage by proposing on the Jumbotron. And for a lot of people, this is the moment where Robin loses them for good. Speaking of losing people for good, here's a song on the album called Tippy Toes. Dancing on the tippy toes, the tippy toes. Dancing on the tippy toes, the tippy If this album were a musical, this would be the Shapoopy. Like, it has nothing to do with anything. I guess it's there to lighten the mood, but it's so stupid. The hook is super repetitive, and it's mostly just annoying. After that is something bad, where, again, Robin tries to revel in being a bad boy. What are these backup singers? It sounds like a bad outtake from the Dick Tracy soundtrack. And at this point, I had to wonder, is this album actually bad after all? Actually, the backup singing is kind of awful throughout the album. And once I noticed it, I couldn't not notice it. Oh, and there's a moment where Robin tries his Michael Bublé on and the horns sound like crap. Look, Paula is a rush job. For the Blurred Lines album, Robin worked with the hottest producers like Timbaland, Will I Am, The Neptunes. Paula is produced by Robin and his regular collaborator Pro J and no one else. And he pounds out the record in a month. Not only is he turning off his old fans with all the public drama, He's turning off the new fans he made with Blurred Lines. I'm sure that in the thick of it, <laughs> the thick of it, I'm sure that in the thick of it, all the drama felt like something he needed to address, and quickly. But did he? I, I don't care about Robin Thicke. He's not like an icon or anything. Before this shit show record, I didn't even know they were married. Like, maybe his divorce matters to his diehard fans, or if you're super into R&B or tabloids, but to the casual listener, he's just the Blurred Lines guy. Just make Blurred Lines part two. But he's not. And there's no radio hooks on the album. Internally, Robin's label is having the same problem. They think of the record as more of a mixtape and not a real album, and they don't think it's a good idea to treat it like one, but Robin cannot be dissuaded. Album hey, day! We're popping bottles and uh, it's album time. I yeah. just bought the album too. July 1st, the album drops. 
Robin Thicke does a number of radio interviews to promote it, and he looks a fucking wreck. Last year's really just kind of a blur in many ways. Not One no. serious disadvantage of being a white boy in R&B is that black don't crack, as opposed to Robin, who is not aging well at all. He's pushing 40, and he looks like he's put on 40 more in just the past year, and all the substance abuse cannot be helping. It will never be easier to drop him from your life. The album comes out, and reviews are... mixed. Some critics think it's embarrassing in a positive way, you know, it's honest, it's raw, it's dark. Others think it's embarrassing in an embarrassing way. Some critics are even harsher. But what the critics think doesn't really matter considering what's coming. Forever love, oh, forever love. The album, it ends with Forever Love, a song which kind of sounds okay as a fond goodbye, but unfortunately I was introduced to it as a creepy public manipulation, so yeah. And that'll take us to July 8th. The sales numbers from the first week are in, and they are catastrophic. In the US, it sells 24,000 copies. For perspective, the debut album of Jordan Smith, who won season nine of The Voice, sold 54,000 copies its first week. Who the fuck is Jordan Smith? I don't know, but he's more than twice as big as Robin Thicke, apparently. That's an 86% drop from Blurred Lines. And that's before looking at the numbers from other English-speaking countries where Robin had also been big. 550 copies in Canada, 530 in the UK, 158 in Australia. Not 158,000, 158. These numbers are impossible. People sell more records in Times Square on the street than Robin Thicke sold in England. Even people who hated him couldn't fathom how low he'd fallen. The same man who was just a year earlier bragging about the size of his dick now looked flaccid and shrunken and deflated. The end of the Get Her Back video promises that this is only the beginning. It was not. There would be no second single. The marriage of course did not recover because putting your wife's name on a giant flaming world renowned failure is generally not considered a good move. If Paul has ever even listened to the album, we don't know. She's never discussed it publicly, and she doesn't really need to. She just let it fail on its own merits. Robin has been trying and failing to put out another record since then, but none of his singles have gone anywhere, so the album remains unfinished and unreleased. Seems like most everyone is done with him. And yet Robin Thicke says he has no regrets about it. Well, yes he does, about the public appearances and the marketing and maybe even charging money for the record, but he doesn't regret putting it out there. He says it's honest and he's proud of it. Look, Marvin Gaye's Here My Dear was also a critical and commercial flop at first. Today it's considered a masterpiece. Robin is no Marvin Gaye, but it wouldn't surprise me if the Paula album gains defenders in hindsight. Like Gone Girl, it's a man realizing just how limited his charm is. And since it failed so hard, there's the pathos of the sad Affleck meme around it now. It's so naked and pathetic. And maybe that alone is as much a manipulation as the more obvious attempts that failed. I can't really sympathize with him, and I can't quite recommend the album either. Too much of it just flatly sucks, and its very existence is so shitty for the woman it's addressed to. But despite myself, I can't claim that I didn't find Thick's wallowing at least partially compelling. Like I said, people wanted to see Robin Thick fail. And on the album Paula, he gave me exactly what I wanted. Yeah.